in America, the tech companies that we focus on are commonly known as FANG. Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google. We all know what these companies do because they impact our daily lives as Americans. In Asia, there are three giant tech companies that have similar scale. Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, otherwise known as BAT. Technology within a location is shaped by the cultural pressures of that location. You might think that we live in a global society, but tech in Asia is dramatically different than it is in America. Differences in culture lead to differences in product development. In China, a different political system contributed to a more rapid development of online payments. Because of this, there is more payment data, and because there's more payment data, people can be given loans more efficiently. Fewer people in the population are unbanked. Online payments are mostly handled by WeChat, a social networking product from Tencent, and Alibaba, which is an e-commerce giant. If you live in the West, imagine that Facebook and Amazon handled most of your payments for everything. You would have a different relationship with these companies. Bernard Leong is the host of Analyze Asia, a podcast about Asian developments in technology and business. After studying material science in Singapore and theoretical physics in Cambridge, he made his way into business and journalism and developed an interest in the singularity, a subject that few people took seriously until recently. In fact, one of the topics that we explored in this episode is Masayoshi Sun, the Japanese tycoon who wants to invest nearly a trillion dollars into technology companies. Masayoshi believes firmly that the singularity is coming. I greatly enjoyed talking to Bernard in this episode. I hope to have him on at some point in the future again. And you should check out his podcast, Analyze Asia. The octopus, a sea creature known for its intelligence and flexibility. Octopus Deploy, a friendly deployment automation tool for deploying applications like .NET apps, Java apps, and more. Ask any developer, and they'll tell you that it's never fun pushing code at 5 p.m. on a Friday and then crossing your fingers hoping for the best. We've all been there. We've all done that. And that's where Octopus Deploy comes into the picture. Octopus Deploy is a friendly deployment automation tool taking over where your build or CI server ends. Use Octopus to promote releases on-prem or to the cloud. Octopus integrates with your existing build pipeline, TFS and VSTS, Bamboo, Team City, and Jenkins. It integrates with AWS, Azure, and on-prem environments. You can reliably and repeatedly deploy your .NET and Java apps and more. If you can package it, Octopus can deploy it. It's quick and easy to install, and you can just go to octopus.com to trial Octopus free for 45 days. That's octopus.com, O-C-T-O-P-U-S dot com. Bernard Leung is the host of Analyze Asia, a podcast that is among one of my favorites. Bernard, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for getting me on the show. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's a lot to talk about, everything in Asia, and Asian technology is in many ways quite different than that of Silicon Valley, which is what I'm most familiar with. And when I first started getting into technology, the perception of Asian technology companies, and maybe I was reading from a biased set of sources, but the perception was that Asian companies were lagging behind the U.S., and in some sense, they were copying the U.S., and they would just copy, but they would do it efficiently, and that's how they would become market competitors. Whether or not that's true, today, Asian companies are leading innovation in several sectors. You look at social media, you look at Bitcoin, you look at other industries that we'll get into, and Asian countries are leading. What are the technology sectors where Asian countries are advancing faster than the United States today? 
Mm. So the perception of Asia technology companies used to be lagging behind the US and copying is not new. Actually, this happened about 30 years back when Japan is the rising economic power in the 1980s. Uh, that was where the time where there is the Sony Walkman and then there is Toyota in manufacturing, which essentially they leapfrog and innovated. Then it happened again for China when China is on the rise in the early 2000s. If you are a fan of history like myself, the same thing actually happened during the Industrial Revolution when the US also copied some of its innovation from Europe and subsequently leapfrogged Europe in the early 1900s. And of course, after World War II, they also became a innovation superpower. So it is pretty important that this is part of most Asian countries' evolution. Today, we are actually, as you rightfully perceived, China is starting to flex their muscles in innovation with tech companies such as Huawei and the BAT, which we are going to go a little bit deeper later. Broadly speaking, I'll break it into a few key countries where they're leading in technology. If you look at Japan, there is robotics, there is hardware design and interaction. For example, console gaming by Sony. I don't know how many of your uh, listeners actually play the PlayStation. And you have lean manufacturing that's pioneered by Toyota in car manufacturing. This is going to become very important for self-driving cars because the technology companies need to understand how to manufacture cars at scale. If you look at Korea, they are leading in solid-state hard drives and screens, which is the OLED screen that now Apple is using for their iPhone 10, for and also many, many Asian OEMs, or like for example, Huawei and Xiaomi are using these solid-state hard drives and screens. Then you look at Taiwan, semiconductors. Then you have TSMC, who's produced the A10, A11 chip for Apple. And then you have a company like Foxconn, which I think a lot of people mistaken them just being a contract manufacturing company. Foxconn is actually a large-scale contract manufacturing company, meaning that they can not necessarily taking, take out an entire town in China or city in China to produce like 10 million iPhones at scale. They have actually also started evolving using robotics to do some of their manufacturing as well. And of course, in China, you will look at AI that's pioneered by Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. You have the blockchain, which is led by Bitmain which is, I think they have about 70 to 80% market share in uh, Bitcoin mining equipment. You also could think of uh, DJI, 80% market share in consumer drones, fintech, renewable energy, and hardware. So broadly, these are some of the technology sectors that Asia countries is leading. I think a lot is in hardware, but I think gradually we are moving towards a software stack as well. And since I'm an American and I have my Amero-centric view I've got to ask, to what degree is the relationship between uh, the United States and Asian countries, specifically I'm thinking of Shenzhen, Mm. to what degree is it codependent? It is very dependent because the largest export market for China's tech is the US, right? I think bilaterally between the US and China, trade relations are pretty important. Of course, China produces most of the hardware that the world uses. So if you think about a U.S. relationship with across Asia, I think it differs. If you were to look at Japan, Korea, South Korea, they're traditionally allies to the U.S. and of course Taiwan as well. They actually do a lot of the sort of the hardware manufacturing piece and also some of the trade as well. If you look at China, is I think there are different dimensions of relationship there is the part where economies economics wise they're actually pretty dependent on each other because they are both the number one and the number two economic superpower in the world so if there is no bilateral trade we're going to have a big issue uh, to the world economy itself so that's how i would characterize that relationship but if you look at most of the u.s tech companies particularly in the hardware space they're either manufactured from china or from taiwan There's a perception among some places in America that the outsourcing of technology production to China happens just because things are cheaper there or because they have looser regulations around pollution. But that's not necessarily true at this point. At at this point, it's more of a specialized manufacturing discipline, and there are experts in technology manufacturing in a place like Shenzhen that you can't just stand up a copy of in America. Is that correct? That's right. In fact, today, if you go to Shenzhen, you should think of the Shenzhen hardware ecosystem 
being the AWS for hardware, meaning you can manufacture hardware at scale or at demand. At scale means if I, if I have a minimum order quantity of at least 10 million units, you can do it at scale. That's your Apple's, your Samsung. Then there is also the contract at demand, meaning that if you want to do a very small quantity, like some most of your Kickstarter projects, you can also do it. You can plug into their ecosystem, work with their factories and get it done. But what, what is amazing about the Shenzhen ecosystem is that you can actually, the factories there have actually also adapted their techniques. And let me give you an example. There is a very well-known hardware hacker, Bunny Huang, who goes to Shenzhen very often. He actually based in Singapore, but he's from MIT in the US. And he's most well-known for his hardware hacking book of the of the Xbox console u- using Linux. So he basically manufactures, uh, he, he started a company which is actually dealing with electronics, but actually using plastic LED. And he actually has to work with the Chinese factory in Shenzhen to produce it. And he has to invent his own production technique to do it. So he has actually mm. evolved more than just, you know, hey, I, this is the design, this is the architecture, go produce this for me, you know? Mm-hmm. They are actually, the, a lot of the factories in, in Asia, particularly if you talk about, say, whether it's Korea, Japan, Taiwan, or China, they have evolved beyond that. They have actually evolved right. to take on the technology and actually become better at that. Right. That guy you referred to, what, his name is, is it Bonnie? Yeah, Bonnie Huang, yeah. Bonnie Huang, was he in that video that Wired yes, produced? Yes, that's right. That's saw. the guy you are talking about. Okay, I'm going to put that in the show notes. That video is awesome. It's basically a condensed tour through the manufacturing process and the oh, just the market for components, of, like the hardware components where you could just walk through this shopping mall-like area and grab smartphone screens and little chip components, GPS units, uh, like Legos. It's like a, a Lego shopping mall of, of little components that you can use to build hardware. It's, it's, it's kind of tremendous. I've never seen anything like it. Yes, it's like a hardware supermarket, basically, but at a billion scale, basically. Okay, so let's talk about BAT. In the U.S., we have the big tech companies known as Fang, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. In Asia, there is BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Let's go through these different comparisons of, you know, the kind of the the, the companies and their counterparts. So you've got, uh, well, actually, I think even calling them counterparts, like saying Baidu is the Chinese Google it's probably misleading, right? Should we how how should we even approach the comparison of these, or should we look at it as fang bats? Should we just look at them as seven or eight giant companies, and uh, you know, you know, f- forget the mirror comparison? Mm. If you ask me this question, I would possibly say that it if uh, the BAT is really a phenomenon in China, and that's how you probably would compare between China versus US, because there are also other powerful tech companies in the region with SoftBank in Japan, Samsung in Korea. So, but when it comes to Baidu and Google, the Baidu, let's, let's, let me just use a very simple metric looking at their market capitalization. So Baidu today is at uh, US 93.4 billion, founded by Robin Lee and Eric Shi versus Google, Sergey and Larry, which is now at US 694.6 billion. Okay, approximately based on the numbers that I've got today. So they started off very similar to Google with a search engine. I think if you have read the book In the Plex by Stephen Levy, Mm -hmm. which there were three groups of people that used the same search algorithm and and two of them became billionaires. One is Robin Lee, which did Baidu. And one is again Larry, which did Google. And then the other guy was became a professor in one of the universities. (laughs) Oh. Yeah. So, so, so the the back story is that after Baidu has evolved its search engine to become very similar to Google, and of course with Google's exit from China, basically handing handing them the entire market. Today's Google Baidu's market share in China is, is only seventy percent. Okay, not not ninety percent is what everybody predicted. So they evolved their businesses. They have actually added things like maps. They have focused a lot on AI and the AI that they are using. It's not 
is actually very pragmatic. They actually uh, develop a lot of AI stuff in the Baidu Research Labs in Silicon Valley, and they actually use onto their advertising products to actually help them to do retargeting as well. And of course, they have recently created Apollo, which is an open AI platform that is actually doing autonomous driving. There were a lot of partnerships as well. If you look at Baidu as a company today, I would say that they are really a software AI company hmm. rather, rather than just being a search engine. And Alibaba, I was uh, I, when I was at Amazon, I worked at Amazon briefly for only eight months. But when I was at Amazon, I kind of got the sense I would I would I would look out into the competitive landscape and I would look at Alibaba and be like, that company looks like it could potentially compete with Amazon. I mean, not not that. I mean, these companies, it's such a blue ocean that they re- don't really need to think of each other as competitors, but everybody thinks of each other as competitors. So how does Alibaba compare to Amazon? And by the way, I will say, Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba, is so charismatic. He he is one of the few people who has charisma that rivals that of Amazon's Jeff Bezos. Mm. So this is where the market cap metric becomes very uh, interesting because just now when I told you about Baidu and uh, Google, it's a difference of seven times, right? Alibaba's market cap today is actually about $449 billion versus Amazon, which is at $484 billion. So both companies have evolved early through e-commerce. I think Alibaba takes a more eBay-like model, subsequently evolved to become similar to the Amazon model. And they have also focused a lot with logistics with, Ch- with a company called Tainia, which they actually invest a lot. Uh, a lot of people probably wouldn't know. If you are a foreign company who wants to enter China, and you want to run software services on China, you better be running on uh, Alibaba Cloud, which is their cloud computing platform that's equivalent to uh, Amazon. And I think in the last two years, one of the things that Alibaba has been focusing on in their cloud computing conference is talking about quantum computing. And this is something that, you know, only, I mean, we haven't heard this in AWS at all. And similarly, they also have been focused a lot on entertainment like Amazon. They are funding a lot of Hollywood movies. I don't know whether recently if you have been uh, watching some of these movies with China influence involved, you will see the Alibaba entertainment as well. So this is actually comparative. They are actually both very similar. But what is really interesting now is that both Alibaba and Amazon are actually having an open battle in two major Asian markets. One is India. Uh, where they are going to be, Amazon is going to be pumping five billion into that market to take out Flipkart, which is actually and Snapdeal, which is backed by Alibaba and Tencent. So there is a proxy war going on in India and in Southeast Asia. Uh, Alibaba uh, owns Lazada, which is run by the formerly run by the Samuel Brothers from the Rocket Internet, and the company that I work for, of course, of of, of disclosure, uh, Singapore Post, is invested by Alibaba as well. Oh. So they actually run. We actually run the logistics. I'm part of the executive team that actually did that. That that actually uh, they get at the Alibaba investment. So what was interesting about Alibaba in Southeast Asia and with uh, Amazon is that now there is a second battleground opening, but for Indonesia, which is probably in Southeast Asia with the largest population, about two hundred and seventy-two million people, almost these e-commerce platforms are actually going to be fighting for market share across these two regions within Asia. And they are actually uh, adopting the same set of tools. You have e-commerce, you have the cloud computing, you have entertainment, and you also have logistics as well. You are programming a new service for your users, or you are hacking on a side project. Whatever you're building, you need to send email. And for sending email, developers use SendGrid. SendGrid is the API for email, trusted by developers. Send transactional emails through the SendGrid API. Build marketing campaigns with a beautiful interface for crafting the perfect email. SendGrid is trusted by Uber, Airbnb, and Spotify. But anyone can start for free and send 40,000 emails in their first month. After the first month, you can send 100 emails per day for free. 
Just go to syndgrid.com slash se daily to get started. Your email is important. Make sure it gets delivered properly with SendGrid, a leading email platform. Get started with 40,000 emails your first month at sendgrid.com slash se daily. That's sendgrid.com slash se daily. That brings us to WeChat. Tencent owns WeChat. WeChat could be described as the Chinese Facebook, I guess. How accurate is that comparison? No, I think everybody gets Tencent wrong. I think Tencent, one should actually look at Tencent's history. Uh, Tencent started off as actually a messaging app on the desktop with a app called QQ. So if you're in the early 2000s to 2010, uh, QQ is probably the default messaging app in China, all right, Mm -hmm. using the desktop. Mm -hmm. Uh, WeChat is the second incarnation of Tencent. There's very interesting ethos within Tencent. They like to incubate many ideas within a company, even to the point it disrupts itself. So the WeChat team is one of the few teams that actually managed to disrupt QQ. If you look at today, they are actually Tencent owns three killer apps. One and of course everybody knows WeChat, but do you know that the QQ that used to be the messaging app on the desktop has also evolved to mobile and now it's only for the equivalent of millennials for China. So a lot of the younger generation of Chinese actually use the QQ app. And the other third killer app is actually in gaming. Is uh, Honor of Kings. I don't know whether, have you all played any game? They actually run by different names in different countries now, but um, Honor of Kings is one of the most yeah. addictive social gaming, social game in China now. And it's actually also going worldwide as well. So if you think about market cap, well, going back to the market cap analogy, actually Tencent is pretty close to Facebook at 480 billion and, fa- and Facebook is at 511 billion. So, and I think so Facebook's, business model is very dependent on advertising. Despite how much they wanted to do a uh, messaging app, they wanted to use uh, Facebook Messenger to clone WeChat, they haven't been very successful. And Tencent has been already, if you look at average revenue per user, Tencent, the mm-hmm. average revenue per user in 2016 for WeChat is seven US dollars. That means for every user would pay seven US dollars to, te- to Tencent every month and Facebook is only less than uh, if you take the global average is only less than one, 150 US dollars and I'm sorry maybe I misunderstood but it, some of this is direct payments it's not yes it's, it's not like advertising it's not eyeballs it's services games content yes Tencent has won the Keynes award in in France which is most well known for Hollywood celebrities as one of the biggest platforms because they are actually the entry point for most content into China. So they also have a, a strong, they have like, for example, WeChat has not turned on its advertising. That's very similar to the Facebook feed kind of advertising at full scale because they are really, what, what Tencent is really concerned about is user experience. Mm-hmm. So they have focused a lot, have, have been making a lot of money through their app ecosystem because in China, you spend almost, I think, on average, three hours on WeChat. You never get out of the app, but you can book a taxi. Right. You could read news. You could do, even listen to court proceedings. You could book your your hairstylers, you know. And you're just paying for everything through WeChat, right? Like, like when you're walking around and you're... Like if you're walking through a shopping mall and you purchase a T-shirt, you're paying with WeChat a lot of times, right? But you also could be paying with Alipay. So the market share between uh, Alipay and uh, WeChat Pay, which is actually uh, uh, under Tencent, is actually, I think Alipay is about 50%, and then uh, WeChat is about 30%. And China leapfrogged the U.S. in terms of electronic payments. We still do not make most of our payments through our smartphone. I, I believe, I don't know the numbers, but I don't feel like I can reliably walk anywhere and just pay with, with Apple Pay on my smartphone. I, I mean, and I live in San Francisco. Why is that? Why did that leapfrog happen in China? 
This is a very good question. So the payment infrastructure in most developed countries in Asia are probably similar to the US. I would say, for example, Japan and Singapore. But except the backend infrastructure of these payment gateways from clearinghouse to routing typically is owned nationally by the country itself. So you can have payment networks like Visa and MasterCard uh, that actually enters into that country. So the official reason is that most monetary authorities of that particular Asian country wants to ensure that it has visibility to all transactions routing through their market against terrorism financing and anti-money laundering. So this is very typical. Mm. But where it comes to China and other developing nations such as India, Indonesia, or even frontier economies like Myanmar, which went from something like 100k uh, mobile handsets to 30 million handsets from 2013 to 2016, okay? There's probably about 2 to 3 billion people, which we call the unbanked. Unbanked people uh, typically don't have bank accounts, they don't have credit cards, and of course, they don't even uh, have access to financial services. This is where China led the mobile payments pretty well, because the mobile payment feature, for example, within, or app within Alipay and Tencent WeChat allowed microtransactions at a very low rate. And at the same time, it also leverages the user's transaction data to determine their credit score. That's very similar to you in the US with your FICO score. So if you perform payments uh, through Alipay, they have, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an app called Sesame Credit, which is also pretty well known in China under uh, N Financial, that is the holding company for Alipay under Alibaba, and that has not IPO yet. <laughs> so, so that particular app actually tries to determine your credit score. In fact, one of the really interesting thing about Alibaba is that they help their merchants to get uh, bank loans through for e-commerce sellers. They actually help them to get by actually telling the bank how much transactions would they get from their e-commerce selling. So this is another way of determining their credit rating for the unbanked, mar unbanked market. And then on top of that, I think uh, both Alibaba and Tencent have also created a small funds, which is that uh, their Chinese customers can invest in. So for example, you and I, probably we top up our mobile credit and we have some spare 2 to $3 within the phone, right? Alipay and uh, Tenpay or Alibaba and Tencent actually uh, uh, have a fund structure where you can invest these unused money into their funds and earn, small, and earn more credits. So you can see the way how they evolve payments is very, very different from how you, have, you or I would have done it in where we respectively are in San Francisco or Singapore. Right. And there was so much there. So I want to try to unpack your answer mm. and explain it in a little more detail. So in the United States, when companies talk about fintech innovation, a lot of times they're talking about building on top of legacy banking infrastructure, which is really hard to do because a lot of the fundamentals of the legacy payment infrastructure relies on long settlement times and doing all this stuff to ensure that transactions are uh, are not fraudulent and and that's great, but it's you know it's the way that they do it is not so efficient and a lot of that is because, you have these different banks. Banks are you know, built on old infrastructure, but also they each have their own interests in mind. If you could just have some shared platform, that would be great. And, and if you have a shared platform, you, you can actually reduce, trans, you can reduce the overall transaction costs because you can do things like, like I think of, of TransferWise is a great example. I don't know if you know the company TransferWise. Yes, I do know that. Right, so TransferWise I think is like the perfect example of this because... On TransferWise, you can say, I, I want to transfer $15 to uh, Bernard in China. And it and normally, if I was just using different banks to, to do that, I would have to send $15 to my bank. I would pay a transaction cost, and my bank would transfer $15 to your bank. Maybe there's another transaction cost associated there, and then they would transfer that into your bank account. But TransferWise, for example, might have a bank account in the United States and a bank account in China. So that when I transfer fifteen dollars to Bernard on TransferWise, they can just switch some numbers around because they own both of those bank accounts, and it's it these are just bits flipping, and they don't have to pay these high transaction costs. So in a sense, TransferWise is a layer on top of the original banking system, but it it pulls them away. It, it the the their infrastructure pulls them away from having to deal with the extra costs of of being on that banking infrastructure. 
Now, the the lower level version of that, the extremely low level version of that is Bitcoin, and I'm sure we'll get there eventually. But you know, Bitcoin just is a totally decentralized settlement protocol. But what you were describing there with with China was basically a top down effort to say we want to improve the financial efficiency of this country because this will it, this will lift people out of poverty essentially and they, what they said was okay we're going to make a top down effort we're going to get everybody using electronic payments partially because it will get people under a little more you could call it surveillance we would call it surveillance with uh, a you know a sense of judgment in the united states i would say you know there is a lot of strengths to that quote unquote surveillance because you get tons of data, which gives you better lending rates, which allows for more people to become banked. And so there is a trade-off there. You know, in America, we would love to to just, uh, you know, be like, oh, China, you know, just surveillance state. And, you know, it's it's not exactly like that. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I might be mischaracterizing something, so I, so I won't go much further. But basically, the idea is that, you know, in China with Alipay and with WeChat, I, what's the WeChat payments? Is it was a WePay? Tenpay, Tenpay, Ten, Tenpay. With with Tenpay, they've got a top down effort to get payments going, sort of transfer wise style, and they get to avoid the transaction costs. Am I portraying your financial portrait of the world correctly? I think I would have to add on a little bit more to, okay. to that conversation. So when China started opening up the, its doors and actually started building its own economies, they have actually built the traditional banks. But one of the things they actually did is that when the technology companies such as ba- uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent came in, they allowed them to set up mobile wallets and allow these mobile wallets to subsequently create financial services that become more and more like banking fin- and financial services. So try to imagine the same situation with Amazon trying to develop a payment, correct? And started to developing infrastructure that's similar to the banks. Then what they did is, okay, we now see that you have a high adoption rate of these mobile payments and you can start giving banking service. We now have a a bank's license that you need to have. So now you see that uh, Tencent and Alibaba has to get a banking license, but actually a much more evolved banking license that's different from traditional banks. And actually, the, the trick of it is that the technology companies in China are allowed to work with the banks direct. So the bank, the banks in, in, in China had no digital infrastructure. So they relied on the Alibabas and the Tencent to actually give them that digital structure. That, that's why you see this capability forming. It's not that the Chinese government had a very top down. They actually oh. been very patient. They looked at where the traditional banking is going. They look at where the digital tech companies are going. They let it evolve to the point where they think, okay, there are some issues that come on from this digital banking, be it fraud, be it you know, money laundering. So now we're going to start putting some regulation and these guys have to give us uh, things like, okay, where's the transaction data to mm. prevent money laundering or pre- prevent uh, counter-terrorism financing. So, so these are things that um, people don't see. People think of Chinese government as being a monolithic authoritarian government. That's not true. It was actually a very interesting government that has a very different way of thinking about technology because I think it's run by a group of technocrats, people who understand technology. So they actually try to introduce technology into their financial system. Whereas in the US, you're very burdened by most of your traditional uh, systems, tr- traditional banking legacy systems. And hence, that evolution has not taken place. If you get... yeah. This is why I need to visit China because, uh, you know, I did an interview with, a, I don't know if you know, a guy named Kaiser Kuo. Yes, uh, I know Kaiser very you, well. <laughs> you know Kaiser? Okay, great. Yeah. So podcasting friends, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, so he is, what does he do? He's at uh, Formerly Baidu. the head of international relations in Baidu. Uh, I interviewed yes. him as well on my show as well. Oh, okay. So, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I just remember I talked to him and, and he... I had I just it was one of those interviews where I was like my perception of China is so messed up it's so wrong I don't know if it's it it kind of feels like I've been brainwashed you know like where you have the the media just like feeding you these subtle signals that China is inferior or authoritarian it just, 
Am I alone here, or does that happen? Does that happen in in China where, with the reverse, where you know th- there's a subtle perception that there's something stupid about America, or? No, I don't think so. I think the Chinese uh, w- wants to think of themselves as trying to invent technology to solve its own problems. Right. And and the way I like to make this joke to a lot of people, whenever you hear Singapore, Hong Kong, or London claiming to be the fintech capital of the world, okay, <laughs> I will always tell them you you are either smoking crack, okay, because the I would call you a fintech capital of the world. This is, happens to me when I was visiting Hangzhou, Alibaba's headquarters. I went there with a lot of renminbi, which is the Chinese uh, yuan cash, right? Mm-hmm. I literally walked in and walked out without spending a single cent. Yeah. And it's funny, like a fruit store with two bamboo poles, you know, with a small yeah. shelter. You can do a QR code scanning and buy bananas. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. D- now, s- okay, I'll just I'll just play the the American devil's a- advocate style argument. Some people would say that the valuations of the Chinese companies are mistaken because the financials are totally opaque and uh, you know that kind of argument. How much substance do you think there is in the Chinese tech giants in their in their businesses? Well, I think that the valuations for Chinese tech companies today is rival very similar to the Silicon Valley equivalents. I think for every company, they are unique by itself. So depending on how their market share or their unit economics, the valuation is justified through that. Yes, there's an overheated valuation crisis going on in, in China's venture capital as you know some of these startups are actually getting more crazier valuations. But I think there are also some gems within that actually justifies that valuation. So, for example, if you look at a company like Toutiao, I don't know whether you have heard this. It's a news reading app. In fact, Y Combinator has recently yes. done a very interesting analysis of it. Yes, I now, read that. What Toutiao is, is totally would blow your mind. They're basically an AI company. <laughs> yeah. All right. They basically get you to tell them what news feeds you read. Because I can read Chinese. So yeah. I go and basically subscribe different news feeds. And based on how I interact with the app, the app will try to ju- modify the way how it presents this information to me based on what I want. And it's running when on I, the business, same business model as Facebook as well. When I was reading about that, I was like, when is this going to be in America? I want to use this product, like right now. Yeah. Well, you have a poorer equivalent of it. It's called Apple News or you know, Google, <laughs> oh, yeah, Google Apple News, News, right? That's true, right? You think about it. If you think about it, it's not it, even close. close though, yeah, to, it's not even close to, to what Toutiao is. Toutiao is, or what is it? Tao, Tao. Toutiao. <laughs> Toutiao. Toutiao. That's the, yeah. Toutiao is like, it, it like generates articles, right? It's got, yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, it's like one of these automated article writers, which we have these in America, where they like digest sports scores and they spit out a poorly written article. But this is like really, really good writing. It's like good automated writing, right? Like it's it's readable content, or do you have you read it? Is it good? No, is it it's, bad? It's, it's good, except that I think a lot of it is actually they assemble, they aggregate, and then they curate and create the article. So this they is, yeah they plagiarize. Not really plagiarize. So what they do is they take a few sources, they actually use the AI to aggregate the important summaries of that that article itself. Oh, that's and then awesome! They, and then they actually curated it and then they basically present it in the format that is quick size bytes in the mobile phone i think that's one of the one of the innovations i think people didn't underestimate their company for spring framework gives developers an environment for building cloud native projects on december 4th through 7th Spring One Platform is coming to San Francisco. Spring One Platform is a conference where developers congregate to explore the latest technologies in the Spring ecosystem and beyond. Speakers at Spring One Platform include Eric Brewer, who created the Cap Theorem, Vaughn Vernon, who writes extensively about domain driven design, and many thought leaders in the Spring ecosystem. Spring One Platform is the premier conference for those who build, deploy, and run cloud-native software. 
Software Engineering Daily listeners can sign up with the discount code SEDAILY100 and receive $100 off of a SpringOne platform conference pass while also supporting Software Engineering Daily. I will also be at SpringOne reporting on developments in the cloud-native ecosystem. I would love to see you there and have a discussion with you. Join me December 4th through 7th at the SpringOne platform conference and use discount code SEDAILY100 for $100 off of your conference pass. That's SEDAILY100, all one word for the promo code. Thanks to Pivotal for organizing Spring One Platform and for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Yeah, now that's so that's so interesting. Do you what is ah oh man, so many questions. So is, what is the media landscape like in in Asian countries? Because like in, in the United States, you know, we kind of had this concern. Uh, especially like with the rise of Trump, people were starting to say, whoa, thank goodness we have New York Times and Washington Post and Wall Street Journal and these other hallowed institutions, and we're going to subscribe to them to continue giving them money. But if you had automated news aggregators that are pulling the best pieces of information from these companies, then you wouldn't be able to perhaps maintain a subscription model because people wouldn't be paywalled. I don't know. Maybe you could t- tell me a little bit more about the, how the media landscape is working. The media landscape in Asia is very varied. So you could have very open ones like India, Japan, Korea, where it's totally the media is actually like the fourth real estate where they actually check you, basically, right? The, the checks and balance similar to the US model. But when it comes to China, Singapore, and some other Asian countries, um, the government takes a very direct hand in regulating the kinds of media, as long as it's not sensitive to them. For example, political. For example, uh, something to do with um, alle- making allegations that someone is corrupt. These are the kind of things that it gets them very sensitive. Or, you know, trying to compare the Chinese leaders to the Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, mm. you heard about that, right? So even no, I don't know what you're yeah, talking because, about. Because because China so so Ch- uh, China actually banned Winnie the Pooh because there was this yeah. photo of Obama and and Xi Jinping and she, and they compared the same uh, picture from Winnie the Pooh and Tiger, and to be honest, it actually makes him look good. But unfortunately, in China, lead um when you're a Chinese leader, you have to be highly respected. You cannot be right. Not. There's no room for satire. So you, you, you can see the variations of how media regulation works within mm. China, right? So these are things that actually makes these things differ. In fact, the, one of the things that Chinese tech giants have to deal with is actually with the regulators. Because when something becomes very sensitive, they will put a heavy hand down. And I think if I have listened to Kaiser's one of his podcasts, uh, SubChina, and he talks about his experience with Baidu, uh, it's not that Baidu don't push back. They do push back, but they don't say it in front of everybody. So the tech giants in China do push back. But of course, the Chinese government, being the Chinese government, said, no, I have to I have to get you to blanket ban with these keywords, this, these terms. So mm. I think this is one of the struggles that they're going to have when these Chinese tech giants come out of China. Bitcoin. We got to talk about oh, Bitcoin. Yeah. I don't think you or I is fully equipped to understand the political nuances within Bitcoin, the forks and whatever else is going on in Bitcoin right now, but I'm sure you can understand the politics outside of Bitcoin relative to Bitcoin. So what kind of crackdown is going on uh, vis-a-vis Bitcoin and how effective has it been? Why is the government doing that? Okay, so I think there are three things. It's interesting because I've interviewed a, series, a few guests recently to talk about Bitcoin ICOs and blockchain in China. So uh, to to Bitcoin, is China's involvement with Bitcoin is has a big impact to the world because Bitmain produces... 70% of all the Bitcoin mining equipment in the world or any other cryptocurrency mining equipment. They're the most efficient. They're based in Beijing, pretty well known. And then you have uh, three big Bitcoin exchanges, which is going to be shut down by the Chinese government, uh, OKCoin, OK B, and BTC China. And then you also have new projects that I would say uh, that evolve similarly 
to Ethereum. Uh, you probably heard of Ethereum, right? The smart contracts token that's responsible for all the ICOs, which is new and quantum. They're also coming out from China. So now, what is actually happening in the cryptocurrency space in China is a little bit more nuanced than what people, how the media portrays it. Okay, what the media gets right is yes, China banned ICOs. Okay, but what's the rationale of banning ICOs? They're banning ICOs because the Chinese are looking for the the day to day Chinese are looking for things to invest in, and these tokens are starting to become more and more prevalent in the China in China. And what the governments worry about is scams that it goes into a kind of bubble, crypto bubble, and subsequently will lead to a lot of loss of financial wealth. So they took an open approach to ICOs, but they saw the the the, the growing scams coming up. So mm-hmm. they, they went in and they blocked ICOs throughout. Now, Bitcoin exchanges, I think, is a little bit more is a little bit more subtle. Uh, because a lot of I, th- I think in the last one two years the Chinese government is actually trying to stop uh, their local millionaires billionaires to actually funnel their money out of China their wealth out of China so one one way of doing that is actually buying cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. and you'll be you'll be surprised I mean in if you think about uh, cryptocurrencies I think I myself as a cryptocurrency investor uh, because I'm a fan of the technology. As uh, itself, but usually you look at most parts of Asia. Usually, are the tech people doing the investments, or maybe some financial guys, right? But I think in China, the average normal people are actually coming into the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency market. Oh. So, so I think that that nuance view oh. of that is actually making the Chinese government jitter. They didn't ban Bitcoin. Oh, you have to be. Wow. You have to. You have to be very clear about that. If you read their signal. Clearly, they have not banned Bitcoin because they themselves know that China being such a big player to the Bitcoin industry, if they cause a ripple effect to them, they might also cause problems to their own China innovation. So they are actually doing it in in bits and pieces. And I think you might see something different because the, the, the best way I want to do is to give you an analogy. So you probably heard of Weibo, which is a Twitter clone in China, right? Yep. Better than Twitter because they make more money than Twitter and their their stock price is going up in in, in Nasdaq. But what is interesting was uh before and more dynamic more dynamic company. I mean, you had an episode about that's this right, recently. That's right. More, di- that's right. more dynamic company. So the story behind how Weibo started was that actually Weibo is a second generation Twitter clone. So there was a previous generation, the first generation of Twitter clones that was entirely wiped out by the Chinese government because of um a lot of people were voicing out the issues on the Xinjiang province, you know, all these uh, politically sensitive content. And so they were all shut down. And then when Sina said, we are going to build this and we are going to be regulated by the government, then Weibo came up. And that also leads to its rise as well. So I think the way this is going to go for Bitcoin, is going to, for ICOs, is going to be very similar. That means you have the first wave of ICOs and Bitcoin exchanges. They will all be shut down. But what is going to happen is the Chinese government will look for its own champions and say, maybe you guys should just go and build a Bitcoin exchange. And then we just want to have an oversight and then you can evolve. Well, this is, a, this is another example of the misperception of China in America because, I, you know, I get most of my news on Twitter. And this is like reading t- Twitter news from Silicon Valley investors and technologists and even people working in Bitcoin and the perception that I got was that China is shutting down ICOs. It's shutting down Bitcoin exchanges because they want to have uh, a totali- totalitarian authority and prevent money from leaving the Chinese ecosystem. Maybe to some degree that's true, but the difference between China and America that you outlined there is that like in the 1920s in America when your average grandma was buying stocks that she had no business buying because she she was just pouring all her savings into individual stocks and then the market crashed and people's savings got wiped out when when that happened that was not good for the public and you're describing a china where that is occurring with cryptocurrency and that's not occurring in america is that correct that's right and and this is where the the thing about why China is banning ICOs is because your typical grandmas are beginning to get involved with these kind of investments. 
Yeah. So, for example, remember I told you about Alipay and Tenpay having these uh, funds that you can actually invest with your excess credit on your mobile phones, right? It started off being unregulated, but later the Chinese government come in and actually set limits to how much they can invest in. Because they were also worried that, you know, these funds might also end up in trouble later. So they, have, they, they keep a very tight view of the economy because they don't want to get it into a bubble or to end up in some financial crisis. Uh, China is still growing at a 6%, 6 to 8% GDP year on year growth every year. So, yeah. What is it about China versus America where in China, people understand that there is something going on with Bitcoin. They understand that something is going on with ICOs. Maybe they don't make the proper bets. But in America, it seems like there is a very small subset of the United States that understands cryptocurrencies, that understands ICOs, that understands technology. It, it, this is you know, maybe one of the reasons for the growing divide in, in America, in our political system. It seems like in Asian countries, technology is permeating the culture, the pop culture. Everybody understands technology. Everybody's excited about it. Whereas in America, we have this schizophrenia where half of the country will talk about how much they love Facebook and Google and technology and Amazon and all that stuff. And and maybe half or more than half will say technology is bad, it's stealing jobs, etc., is there a, a difference in how unified these countries are in terms of their perceptions of technology? I guess if you think about the Chinese government and most of the Asian governments, some of the politicians are actually technocrats. So they're actually technologically trained, they're engineering trained. So there is a propensity to the way they think about governing the country. They think towards and bringing in technology to solve some of their problems. I think that's one of the prevalent difference I see between the rest, the whole of Asia versus the U.S. Of course, you also have the same kind of politicians similar to the U.S. in some countries. But if you look at China, Singapore, for example, is wholly run by people who are very technology savvy. Hmm. Yeah. So, so this is one, that also explains how they regulate as well, right? They also allow the digital banking thing to work first before they started coming in and regulate it because they want to see how this technology would evolve to solve some of the common problems of the unbank in, hmm. in these markets. I think India is taking a very similar approach. Uh, like, for example, Paytm, which is very similar to Alipay, and it's also invested by Alipay and SoftBank. So, you know, these things will actually, these pragmatism will come into how technology is being adopted. I think Asians see technology as a, as a tool to solve their problems. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the real fundamental cultural difference. Yeah. Hmm. Well, and... The synthesis of the the techno the technological virtual world and the real world seems a lot more seamless uh, in in Asia as we've already discussed with the seamless payments infrastructure and I don't know uh, so but but in America at least and again I I'm I'm so isolated I don't spend I haven't spent enough time in other countries I should visit a lot of other countries but there is a fear that social media and other t addictive technologies lead to isolation. How isolated are people in Asia? Or do, do they find ways to use technology to become closer together? I think they use technology tools to connect to each other. Funny, I actually have used a lot of social media tools. I use Facebook to connect with people all over the world except China, and I use WeChat to connect people from China. So mm. it's the same. But I think the same kind of issues you're going to have, like, for example fake news you know people become very polarized i think the issues are that's happening in asia that's too. happening in asia except that the governments have a stronger hand in regulating these media so it used to be regulating media is a bad thing in the u.s right because of their first amendment rights but i think in asia this now becomes very useful because uh it distinguishes uh, fake news from real news as well so the Asian governments tend to be heavy-handed when it comes to this kind of fake news, even getting suing the uh, media outlet for defamation as well. So you, you see that there is a difference in the way how we look at media as compared to, to the U.S. Yeah, I mean, certainly a trade-off that you want to make if you have an uh, intelligent technocratic leader, which unfortunately we don't have right now. We've got somebody who uh, retweets 
bots. Unfortunately, we had like, he, I've, Trump has retweeted a bot at least one time that was just yeah. Anyway, so I, I don't think we have a great sense uh, of what is fake news in our leadership, mm. uh, unfortunately. But if Obama was running things, I would be like, yes, ob- absolutely. Our Obama can be the arbiter between what is real and what is fake news. I would feel comfortable with that. So. That's right. Interesting question. Let's go to ride sharing. Mm. Explain how ride sharing in Asian countries differs from America. So I think in today, there's not much difference because I think all the ride sharing companies are basically have two kinds of ride sharing. One is what you the best is to use uh, the Uber analogy. So uh, Uber started with Uber Black, right, which is the luxury car service, and then you call, you get a black car and then you go on to it but where the asia innovation came is actually where the ride sharing companies built on the supply of the taxi fleets or in us we call the medallion uh the yellow caps right where they actually used their pricing and basically try to match between uh ride riders and also the drivers so that that itself has has become the business model for uh, not just Uber but Didi in China, Grab in Southeast Asia and Ola in India, and they are all each regions of power, all funded by the same company. Soon Uber will be funded by the same company, which is SoftBank, right? Which we have didn't talk about yet. What was interesting for for ride sharing in China now? There's a there's a new evolution between zero to three kilometers the ride sharing market is wiped out by bicycle sharing. Actually, I don't want to call it bicycle sharing. It's called bicycle rental, actually, where you can actually rent a bicycle from the point that you walk out of a subway. You take about less than 500 meters right to your nearest location using a bicycle. So these bike sharing companies like Mobike, Ofo are now basically jump-started very quickly and I think is scaling across the world, including into the US universities as well. So yeah, that, that, that is why ride sharing has a different evolution now. There is now the zero to three kilometer space that's actually dominated by these e-bikes and bicycle sharing companies. Okay, uh, SoftBank. Yeah. Let's talk about that. <laughs> uh, that's a really interesting topic. So people who don't know about SoftBank, this is a technology company. I believe it started as a telecom provider. Is that right? No, it actually started as a software distribution company. I'm a fan of Masayoshi-san. I would... Uh, me too. Yes. Me too. I mean, I'll just give a quick preview. So, I, he, he, you know, he's a technologist. He's got a $100 billion fund that he is aggressively deploying. He's sort of like a technologist version, maybe, of Warren Buffett, That's who right. aggressively invests. Okay, tell, just describe Masayoshi Son and what is going on with SoftBank and what the impact of that is on the technology world. Okay. Masayoshi Son uh, is Japanese. So, SoftBank started in. Japan as a software distribution company. But as they evolved, they did two things. One is they started venture capital and private equity arms that do technology investments. During the dot-com era, the uh, dot-com bubble and dot-com bus era, they were heavily invested into some of the biggest companies of that time. Uh, one of them probably you might know is Yahoo. Okay, And SoftBank actually evolved into a telco somewhere around the year of 2000 by creating a different business model to broadband. They, they started... Uh, using a different business model to that. And then subsequently, their broadband service became so big and then they built their own telecommunications, their own telco. And of course, they have invested in Sprint in the US. And within the SoftBank, they owned Yahoo Japan. They also own the telco and the mobile. But they also have started a new in tech industry, which is robotics. Uh, you have SoftBank's Pepper, right? Is a robot. If you go to Japan these days, you go to all the SoftBank stores, you'll see a Pepper robot that actually has software that actually responds to your emotions and tries to be your customer service representative. And of course, Pepper has been used as a barista in Nespresso in one of the Tokyo cafes. It has also been used as a yeah, banking banking assistant. So you should go and check it out, okay? So I need to check it out. Yeah. That's a human-like robot? Yeah, it's a human. No, it's, a, it's really a robot that's not human-like yet, basically. Okay. But I, I guess this is where uh, SoftBank recently has bought Boston Dynamics and Shelf, which I think they're trying to reclaim the uh, leadership back in robotics from the US because Google had bought out some of these top robotics companies. Now, right. So, so, so robotics was originally led by Toyota, right? right. In Japan, yeah. Uh, Toyota, uh, Panasonic, and Toshiba. 
But what SoftBank is, the other side of it is their investment arm. So in the after the dot-com crash, Masayoshi san didn't give up. So he went to invest Alibaba at 400 million, okay? And he got a return back at 56 billion. Today, the, that particular assets that he invested in Alibaba is worth 90 billion. So you, you have to think about you have, you have to think about how far sighted he was at that point in time, right? Like, you know, yeah. he, he did a lot of interesting investments in, in, in technology companies, not just in Asia, but also in the US as well. So the vision fund that he did, the $93 billion vision fund, is basically, I think one thing that Masayoshi san Oh, it's not, it's $93 yes, billion. Yes, that's the confirmed <laughs> amount, okay? okay? $93 billion. I heard he's now raising the second fund to that, which is probably another $100 billion. But I think what he wants to do is to accelerate certain technology adoption and move towards singularity. I think he likes the idea right. of um, Ray Kurzweil's singular- the singularity is near. Which you do too, right? Yes, I'm part of the Singularity University uh, Global Solutions Program. I'm the alumni of 2016. So I think the thing that he is trying to do with this investment is he's trying to accelerate the technology investments and oh. try to move them towards the next level. Okay, since since we're up against time, uh, people can go check out uh, some shows about Masayoshi Son. There's there's a great Bloomberg show about him that was that aired recently. Let's let's close on the singularity because this is a big idea, and mm. there's not a lot of people who take it as seriously as somebody who puts it together a ninety three billion dollar fund to invest in ideas that might lead to the singularity or leverage at the singularity. And you yourself are a successful business person who openly talks about the singularity and believes in it do you think of the singularity as a religion or a philosophy or a way of life how do you think of it as important to you well as a scientist i don't believe in i believe in hypothesis driven experimental validation i see it more as a philosophy i think one of the things about the uh, technology reaching singularity is that it leads to abundance what does that mean right do you know how much uh, aluminum fog today is Price set, I think it's about two to three dollars. No it's probably two to three dollars. But if I were to tell you in 15th century, the aluminum fork is actually worth one hundred and fifty thousand dollars US. Wow. What has happened, right? In between that, people have discovered aluminum oxide. People has discovered manufacturing method that manufactures aluminum forks at scale, right? Something that is used to be owned by kings and queens today is owned by the common people like you and I. So what the singularities uh, ethos is, is that it leads to a world of abundance. So we live in a world where the economics is driven by supply and demand. And technology has the propensity to actually make resources, infinite, can make infinite supply. And if when infinite supply comes, then you can actually have abundance and people have a share of the resources. And I think this is, this is probably going to be an ongoing theme in the US about income inequality and you know all the pushback against tech giants. So I think the ethos itself is correct. Uh, how we get there is a different different question altogether. So does that mean... Do, do, do you think there's a question of whether we do get there? I think we will get there. Uh, if you are like me, a Star Trek fan, then you would love to be there, right? Replicators? Well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, hey, listen, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm... I'm I'm a little bit uh, I'm I'm scared, you know. I'm a little bit scared that we won't get there because I see the potential. You know, I report on the potential for us to get there every day. It just scares me that we might destroy ourselves before we do. That's right, and I, I also had the same fear like you do. However, I I still think that if you think the underlying concept of the singularity is technological singularity is to move towards a world of abundance, and I think that. One of the things that probably tech companies do to the world is that it lowers the cost of something very scarce to become something very affordable. So if you believe in that, then a lot of the technologies can be made good on that. Of course, they have its own abuses, but I think the overall end state is going to be better in the long run. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a great place to close. Bernard, mm. uh, I love your podcast. I want to thank you for coming on the show. And I, I look forward to getting a cup of coffee with you when either, you know, when I'm when I'm uh, overseas or you're in uh, San Francisco or maybe in virtual reality someday. <laughs> yes, Jeffrey. Thank you for, 
for inviting me and of course you cannot you can always uh, let me know when you're in Singapore because it's where most of the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency foundations are now the headquarters Ethereum is headquarters right. in Singapore now <laughs> so I heard Vitalin always hangs out in one of the Starbucks in Singapore yeah or if you want to go to China we can probably we might even end up meeting in China at some point that sounds great yeah. okay well, uh, well thanks Bernard I'll talk to you soon talk to you soon take care Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash se daily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash se daily. Thanks to Symphono for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily for almost a year now. Your continued support allows us to deliver content to the listeners on a regular basis. Wow!